Today we're going to talk about <laughs> some good coding practices and how to make your website hopefully actually work out in the end. So the first thing I want to talk about is how to use Git responsibly. So this should be pretty obvious to some people, but just make sure you don't forget this before you start working. Always remember to get pull in order to load your teammates' changes. If you don't do this often enough, then you'll run into more and more rich conflicts as you and your partners get more and more diverged. So always keep in sync, always get pull as much as possible. Um, a few things you should also keep in mind is before you commit, what I like to do is always run git status to double check what have I done. So like, for example, I might git status and Like get status and realize that I accidentally changed the file I didn't mean to change. Or even more fine grained, if you want, you can run git diff, which will tell you exactly every line that you changed. I'm usually pretty paranoid with git, so I usually git diff and look at every single line I wrote to make sure nothing was unexpected. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, before you commit, also seems obvious, but make sure you double check that your code actually runs before you commit it to master. Like, at least, at the very least, run npm start and make sure it doesn't, it doesn't like crash. Like, this is obviously broken, so don't just be like, oh, whatever, and commit. <laughs> at least make sure the server starts. It doesn't have to be perfect, but yeah. <laughs> so when do, you, when do you commit? Do I work all day and then make one big commit? Well, typically committing more often is better than committing less often. So usually I try to commit in as like fine-grained things as possible. Like so I add a, one little feature to commit, add one little feature to commit, add one little fix, commit. Um, every commit should add one like focused thing. Like you shouldn't have a big commit that just, you know, like I did all the back end and I did all this other stuff and lumped together. Um, it's a lot easier to manage. Like for example, if something goes wrong and you can't figure out like what commit caused the code to break. If your commit history is nice and lined up and divided like this, it's a lot easier to reason about where things might have broken along the way. But if you have these mega commits, you're going to be sifting through like thousands of lines of code, and it'll be really hard to, you know, to figure out what's going on. So, let's do some dangerous commits you should be aware of. Um, so, you might notice that when you get push, sometimes it will be like, wait, you can't get push because your teammate has been updating code, you have to git pull first. There exists a command which just tells git, like, screw you, I don't care about my teammates. Delete all this stuff, put mine in so. Um, so you might do this online. Don't use it unless you actually know what you're doing. Um, there are actual use cases for this, but just be really, really careful. In most cases, you probably shouldn't use this. Um, in workshops, we've been using git reset hard a lot. Um, I don't want that to become like, Muscle memory, so like before you even need to get me set Just double check, nobody should do that. Because that, if you haven't figured out by now, what that command does, it just deletes everything you've done, not um, Yeah, so when you're actually developing code, I mean, sometimes there'll be a case where I'm writing something, nothing works, and I say, screw it, I want to start over with a blank slate. In that case, I might use this command. But be careful, and know what you're doing before you run. Um, Sometimes you'll commit something, push the master, and then realize, ah oh, crap, this commit is totally broken. I made a stupid typo somewhere. So you might be tempted to Google, how do I change something that I've already committed? How do I edit a commit? It's possible, but you probably shouldn't do it. So if you've committed something already, and then you try to go back in the past and modify the commit, like it's possible with Git, but Git doesn't really like it. When you mess with the past, Git starts to freak out. So in general, what you should do instead is make a second commit saying, I fixed typo or I fixed thing. And that usually, so get, get this will be a bit happier with that. Okay. Let's move on a bit to code, code style and formatting. So when you're writing stuff in React, there's tons of like indents and stuff, and it's really hard to make them look pretty. So when I write code, it ends up looking like this, where it's just all around the place. Can't read what the heck is going on. But there are some tools which will make this a bit easier to manage. Like for VS Code, um, staff uses this extension called Prettier. Um, it notices like a pretty RC in the skeleton code, which is like a settings for this extension. I like to enable the format on save option, which just means whenever I hit Control S, it automatically formats the code. So it looks like this, hit Control S, and it makes it nice and pretty organized automatically. So it's pretty handy. 
So I usually just write everything and it looks like a total mess and then print control S and then it makes all the brackets in the indentation perfect. Um, a word of caution is that if you want to use this, you should probably make sure either everybody on your team should use it or nobody on your team should use it. Because like when you control S, that like, mod that, like modifies a lot of lines. Like it changes basically every line to look nice and pretty. So if I have one person like who's running unformatted code and the other person is using formatted code, like, there's going to be a lot of conflicts there because the indentation is different, and, and Git might start freaking out if that happens. So, due to a few some inconsistencies in using formatting tools, you can run into some nasty merge conflicts. So, I would recommend just to make sure that your team as a whole should agree on whether or not you want to use something like this. So, next, um, writing actual code, like you see the details of the code. Um, so like say I want to add a new feature, but the way I run my code makes this hard to do. It's hard to indicate this feature. So I would need to do some like weird restructuring of my code to make it work out. We kind of saw this, if you remember in the off lecture, when we wanted to hide the new story, hide the new comments bar, we had to do some restructuring of state and props. It was kind of a pain in the ass. So sometimes you might be faced with two options. Do I do it the right way and restructure? Also code, we also called refactoring my code. It might take a while, or I could come up with some clever hack that's like pretty jank but seems to work, and it might take a lot less time. Which one do I do? Um, like, yeah. So what do I say when I mean like happy or janky code? So code can be happy if, for example, it's like super inefficient, like it spams tons and tons of GET requests for no reason, or if it's hard to understand. You've got nested if statements, nested callbacks, and it's impossible to read what the heck is happening, or you know. Uh, happy code is also usually pretty brittle, like like you wrote some code and it like barely works. So if you like add up like one space, the entire like program would explode. Sometimes you write code like that, and you can like you're terrified to touch it because it just looks so sketchy. Um, so that would be kind of happy code. Um, in the best world, in the ideal world, you should just avoid the need for hacks at all by doing a good design that doesn't require you to hack around to get things to work. So. Um, even though your designs will likely change, it's impossible to predict every single thing you're going to need right from the start. But it's a good idea, as we've talked about, to you know, draw out your React control component hierarchy, uh, write out your MongoDB models, talk about it with your team, see if you're missing anything. And also, when it comes to writing your Express API, um, you might want to write something called a specification, which is basically a list of all the routes and all the requirements for the routes. So, for instance, when staff, we, when we were developing portal.weblab.2, we sat down and we wrote a specification for our API. So all the things that the portal needs to do, we made this big doc of a bunch of routes, and for all of them, we talked about like, is it a GET request, is it a POST request, uh, what parameters does it expect, what database models does it need to modify, um, and all that good stuff. And then the team looked at it, we tried to comment on if some things didn't make sense, uh, maybe some things should do something different, this is another potentially good part of the design process. Um, talking more about the signs of having pretty happy code. So there's this thing called code smell. So a code can be smelly if it has some things that are kind of are kind of off, and they indicate that this this repo might have something wrong with it in general. Um, I think a cool website which has a list of a bunch of different signs of code smell, in addition to other things like cool design patterns. It's a pretty nice website. Um, but some of the basic things that indicate the kind of smelly code is, you know, having a lot of copy and pasted sections, um, you know, having functions that are like hundreds of lines long, and having lines of code like like cool one one liners that span like three hundred characters <laughs> and try to do everything at once. Like you you feel kind of cool when you write a nice one liner, but sometimes in practice it's just not practical because nobody can understand it. And you know stuff like that stuff like having functions that are just entirely unused. Um, just, just like unclean, messy looking code. It's kind of an indication that your repo is something that is it's not, it's not perfect. Yeah, so there's another terminology which I think is kind of funny called technical debt, which is something that occurs um, when you choose the quick way out instead of doing a better solution. So if I decided to add a quick hack instead of doing the right thing and restructuring my code, this is, it's, it's like you're taking an easy way out, but you're going to have to pay for it in the future. So this is called technical debt. So you're taking out a loan, basically. So like, 
I'm taking the easy way out, but I'm gonna have to pay this off at a later date, basically. Right? So this can happen when you're just lazy or you don't have a lot of time on your hands. And you try to take the easy way out. But, you know, let's visualize this a bit more. So say I got my web app, I add a new feature to this, that's cool, but it doesn't quite work right, so I need to add a little hack to make it work. Now it's perfect. So I keep doing this, add a new feature, uh, Patrick gives it some hacks, uh, keep going, and then, oh god, oh god, now you, your, your whole repository is built out of, like, spit and duct tape, and it's just, like, barely working, and there's so many hacks. At some point, it's gonna be so cumbersome to work with this repo, you're just gonna not like, make any more progress. You're gonna hit this wall where everything is so sketchy and badly designed that you're just kind of screwed. And the only thing that you need, the only thing you can do is slowly start the long and arduous process of making your code restructure and create again, which is a huge pain. So it would have just been easier just to do it right off the get-go than need to spend some time at the end, like doing all this re refactoring work. So in that sense, people say that Tim will get a cruise interest. So like if you do some hacks and you let it sit for like months and months, then it accrues interest so that like if you want to fix it at the end, it'll be much harder than if you just decided to fix it at the beginning. Kind of thing. So I'm telling you all this stuff about practices, but this is actually worth it. This class is not very long, so like sometimes you'll end up <laughs> needing to throw good practice out the window in order to meet the deadlines. And I've been there too. Like when I took web lab, I was staying up until like 6 a.m. waiting the, the, the code, the code. I looked at it yesterday and I was, it was so painful. I can't believe I wrote code that bad. Um, <laughs> but sometimes you gotta do it. And because this class is kind of a hackathon, for God's sakes, we're calling the thing tonight a hackathon. Um, so you can, you will need to write some hacky code at some point, but I would advise you to keep it within reason. You kind of have this budget of hacks you can use before your code base becomes completely unmaintainable. So just remember to try to keep your technical debt in check. Don't go overboard. Um, you're going to need a few hacks here and there to make the, make the deadlines, but try your best to use good practices when possible. So let's talk about another thing, comments, which is interesting. So here I have two identical functions. The one on the left has commas, the one on the right has, does not. Uh, raise your hand if you think the one on the left is better. Okay, some of you. What about if you think the one on the right is better? Yeah, I would agree. So I'm glad we had a split here. But I would personally say the one on the right is better. But why? Comments are good, aren't they? They tell you what your code is supposed to do. Well, if you actually read these comments, like it's saying, oh, user find ID finds the user by ID. Um, Res.send, send the user. Do nothing. Like, did these comments basically. <laughs> like, because it's possible to comment too much. So, when you use comments that explain the obvious, you're doing nothing but just cutting your code base, right? And it can be a pain, because, for example, I write a bunch of comments, and then I need to change the code. When you change the code, you also need to change the comments. But sometimes you change the code and forget to change the comments. So, then you have comments that are just completely wrong and outdated. And it just, it just becomes worse, which is terrible. I mean, there's some situations where you can add comments, like if you're, if you're like, were forced to add bad and happy code, you might want to leave a comment. Um, should you add a comment when your code is hard to understand? Um, this is something to think about. So this code, I have no idea what this does. Like, what is t, what is r? Why is there a function called get opt for? Who is my array? <laughs> like, <laughs> so should I add comments? I can add oh, a comment that says, oh, T stands for team ID. Is that a good idea? Not really. Instead, um, the, the code smells page has an interesting analogy for this. It says that in some cases, comments are like kind of deodorant that masks the smell of your code. Like, your code is actually pretty smelly, but you're using comments to kind of cover up this fact. Instead, you should write code that's not smelly in the first place. This, this code here, this is the actual code that I use to generate GitHubs, like GitHub should repos for each team. It should be self-explanatory from the code itself. It doesn't need comments. So everything is divided into smaller functions, and each function has a query <coughs> of what its job is. So first, create the GitHub team, create the repo, add you guys to your team, and give you admin access. There are four steps. 
They're all individually modularized into small maintainable functions. And due to this clear naming, there's no need for comments. So this code is, can be said to be self-documenting, meaning that the names of the variables, the way the code is, is laid out, is easy enough to understand so that you shouldn't need comments at all. <coughs> so in general, you should try your best to write code that doesn't need comments, because it's already understandable. I did. It's <laughs> <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Um, I, also, I, I also wrote this, too. <laughs> um, let's talk about debugging now. So, let's say I'm working on the profile page. I've added some new stuff to my Kaplan profile, and it just does this. It says loading forever. Nothing happens. What do I do? Do I go to Piazza and say, help, my website doesn't work, maybe help me? Or you do some <laughs> other debugging steps that you can try first. There are first, there are three things that you need to check. Um, this may seem like common sense to some of you, but sometimes it's easy to forget that there are three separate things that are spewing out messages. <coughs> first is the one in your browser that opens when you push F12. And then there are your two terminals. One is running npm start, it's your backend server. The other one is the hot loader, which might show certain reactions and errors. So look at all three and see, is there something wrong here? Yes, obviously, there's a thing in big red text. It says, I tried to send a get request to API user, and something went wrong. So when that happens, the first thing I do is try to find the relevant piece of code, which is probably the API slash user route or something, and then spam console logs of work. <laughs> this is a tried and tested debugging method. Of course, there's more legit debugging tools, but most of the time you can't go wrong by just printing out some things and seeing what's up. So, yes. Oh my god. <laughs> so I've gone into to the user route and I'm gonna print everything. I'm gonna print rec.query. So that would give me an object of everything the front end has passed to me. I'm gonna print the user ID. I'm gonna print what Mongo returns back. Let's see. Oh that's interesting. Mongo says there is no user document here. That's weird. And it says that user ID is undefined. Um so what is the bug here? It's pretty clear to me now that I see the output. So here we go, there's the bug. It's just a typo. So the front end gave us something user capital ID, and in the back end we said user under lowercase ID. So there's a bug, we just need to fix capitalization, and we're good. And printing out everything allowed me to quickly spot and fix this error. So um, another thing to keep in mind is that depends where you put console log. So if you put in console log in your front end code, it'll go to the front end console, and if the console log is in the back end code, it'll go to the back end console. Just keep in mind that when you're, when you're console logging, you're not sure where, where it's actually picking out to. This is where it goes. Nothing will get printed out to the React hot loader. It'll go to one of these two things. So let's talk about another situation. So I've been writing a new feature for my hot new web app. I wrote 500 lines of code, and I was like, oh, I'm finally done. I'm gonna go to localhost 5000. Nothing works. Where do I even begin? So, the, the real solution is to never put yourself in the situation in the first place. Because <laughs> the more lines of code you have, the more you have to debug. And it's just gonna, when you reach this point, you're kind of just screwed. So, the best thing to do is to make your changes in as small, little additions as possible. So whenever I'm coding, I am terrified to write more than 20 lines of code without testing at least once. So I make like a couple of changes, then open the web app, see if it works. Make a couple more changes, test and see if it works. Um, at every opportunity, try to you know, print out the current state of your application to make sure everything is in check. Um, so write small batches of code at a time. Keep your functions small and modular. You should probably never have functions that are like over 100 lines long, because at that point you should start thinking of breaking them up into smaller functions, which make them easier to think about. So this is what uh, we call the debug loop, of you going through this process of iteratively changing something small and testing it out until it works. Um, one thing that is useful is a lot of people have put some time into figuring out how you can best optimize your debug loop. Because you know, if you can shave a few seconds off every iteration, that starts to add up. We've added some tools for you that make this process a little bit easier. Like for example, the React hot loader. 
every time you make a change, it'll automatically update the front end. So you don't have to run npx webpack every time. So this is one example of useful developer tools that shave time off in the debug loop and make your life happy. So, and finally, I would like to mention the importance of debugging thoroughly. So, even if your code seems to work, like you open up localhost 5000 and nothing breaks, there might still be bugs lurking in there. And so when we test your app, a lot of the times, like, we're gonna uncover some bugs that you never imagined. Because when people use your app, they might break it in ways you never could have possibly imagined. And that is true when you guys have been using the web portal, like the web app portal, I was like, oh wow, somebody's added emojis to the team name. Team name. I never thought somebody would do that, but it totally broke the website. Um, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> so there is a rule, this law called that, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. What that translates to is, given enough people looking at the code, given enough developers, given enough beta testers, all bugs can be quickly discovered and resolved. So all team members, should literally try to test every single aspect of the website. Not just test it, but literally try to make it break. Like try to think of stupid things that no, no reasonable user should ever do and see if your website crashes. Because chances are somebody's gonna try that stupid thing. Um, maybe you get some friends to you know, test out your website once it's up on your Roku. Be like, um, you know, try this out and see if you can make it break or something. Because um, on Stack, we have a lot of eyeballs when we're testing it, we'll we might uncover some bugs that you never knew about. And if your website breaks when we're testing it, please remember that if your website breaks, you don't win WebLab. <laughs> so, <laughs> make sure you if your website doesn't break. Because a simple website that actually works is much better than a complex website that doesn't work. And I say this because I speak from experience when I did WebLab, I was trying, we were trying to insert new, more and more features at the last second, and it was super complicated, and eventually we submitted it to the judges, they tried on the website, and it just didn't work. So that was the end, we didn't win anything. So, and I was pretty salty about that, but then I realized it was just my fault for not focusing on making the fundamentals of the website stable before trying to add on more extraneous features. So that's one lesson that we should probably keep in mind is, Make sure the damn thing works before you try to make it fancy. Okay, so overall, we got these things to keep in mind. Um, I know you guys have a time limit. There's less than two weeks until the final submission is due. But try as much as you can to write decent code. Okay.